Hi everybody, I'm John Townsend. Welcome to the uh, Boundaries video series. And um, Henry and I are having a, a lot of fun uh, taping this and going over the material and uh, refreshing everything. And we hope that you, find, that you find this helpful for your life, your small group, your church, your friendships, marriage, dating life, or whatever. We hope, it's, we hope it brings value. Um, now last time Henry, in the last session, which was session three, he went over the first half, that would be five, the first five of the ten laws of boundaries. And we're going to go over the last five of those laws, so you'll have all the laws in one place and uh, hopefully can make some, some good use of that. And remember, um, and Henry, Henry's talked about this uh, in, in the previous session, but the laws are like, they're like laws of physics. It's like saying uh, gravity is a law. You know, if you jump up, you come down. I can't say, well, I disagree with that law of gravity. I just, uh, you know, I rebel against it. If I jump up, I'm going to come down because the law is a law. It's just kind of the way things work. The law of electricity, the law of magnetism, radiation. Well, that's the same idea here is these are almost like God's laws of physics of relationships. And if you will not fight these laws, but instead take them on and embrace them and learn them and obey them, life goes better. So some people kind of are kind of the natural rebel that'll say, well, you know, you can't tell me what to do, and, you know, I'm my own person. Certainly, you're your own person, but don't fight gravity. It's, things go a lot better when you do it uh, the way that God designed things, and um, everything gets better. Okay, law number six, the law of evaluation. The law of evaluation has to do with one aspect that just people have so much confusion and torment about, and it has to do with pain. Evaluating the pain that your boundaries cause other people. So, hey, there's a great thought. I'm learning boundaries and I'm going to be a pain. Well, <laughs> hopefully you will be a pain the right way and you will be experiencing less pain for yourself because you're doing this right. But here's the conflict is a lot of people are afraid if I say no to this person in my life uh, who, <clears throat> who knows, they're they're always uh, wanting to take time from me that I don't have or money from me or energy from me or that I don't have. Or um, they're kind of controlling me and they're dominating me. Or they want me to take care of their life. All the ways that they're cross boundaries. We call those crossing boundaries. You might have to say no to these people. We Hopefully you're learning that you've got a, you know, a no muscle. We want you to have a good no muscle here. But when you say no to people, it's going to cause them some discomfort. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, I can't wait for my spouse to say no to me. It's going to be a great day. No, it's not going to be a great day. It's going to be a, a, a good, beneficial, but hard day. So many people are, are sort of in conflict about whether they should do boundaries because they're afraid of the pain they're going to cause other people. And it could be the pain of um, <clears throat> disappointment. I hate to see my spouse or my mom or my dad or my kids disappointed. It might be the pain of frustration. You know, who wants to frustrate their kids and put them in timeout? Shouldn't kids be happy and live in Disneyland the rest of their lives? Well, not really. Uh, maybe the pain of somebody uh, being without, you know, uh, without your support. You know, there's people, we, have, we call them dependent personality disorders, for example. And dependent personality disorders are, it's, it's a, it's a tough situation because it's sort of a black hole of need. There's never enough. And if you get with a person who's an untreated dependent, to per dependent personality disorder and you're on the phone with them, you can spend 10 minutes on the phone and then have to get off and they feel they're kind of like Eeyore in, in, a, in a Winnie the Pooh. It's like, oh, okay, I'm abandoned again. Hey, you could spend four hours on the phone with them. And at the end of that conversation with that poor black hole, they can do the Eeyore again. Oh, all you have was four hours for me. So a lot of times we think, well, I can't abandon them, so I'll just stay on the phone and, you know, starve to death while I'm trying to help them. Well, you're not going to help them. But we have the pain of their disappointment, of their frustration, of their being without. And so what we start to think is, am I causing them harm, which means damage? And that's why we think maybe I shouldn't do this because I don't want to feel guilty and I care about this person. I don't want to like, I don't like their disappointment and their frustration they're being without. I don't want to damage them. Well, that's why the law of evaluation is so helpful and so important because the law says that you need to evaluate the pain. And here's, the, here's kind of the key principle here is that there's harm and there's using the wrong 
We're on a highlighter here. I, I feel terrible harm now. I'm just joking. Because of all you codependents out there that are worried about me, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm really okay. Right. There's harm and there's hurt. And hurt and harm are not the same thing. Harm means there's real damage. I mean, you maybe, I don't want to cause somebody's depression or I don't want them to cause their abandonment cycle or I don't want them to go do drugs or, you know, jump off a building. And there's hurt, and hurt just means an owie. You know, I didn't like what you said, but I'm okay. And the confusion comes when we think, is this boundary going to, I mean, the, sorry, the clarity comes, not the confusion. The clarity comes when we realize, wait a minute, I'm, I might hurt this person, but I'm not harming them. You know, we talk in the book about when you go to the dentist, and the dentist says, i got to give, you know, fill three fillings, and it's going to, you know, stick needles into you and all this, and you think, well, that's really hurtful. And then the dentist, a good dentist will say, well, how is it you have to come see me with these three cavities? Well, it was all those cookies and Oreos and not brushing my teeth. And those things didn't hurt. Those, those habits and those cookies, they didn't got, give me pain, but they, they hurt me. I'm sorry, <laughs> they harmed me. And the dentist says, I know, now I'm going to give you some pain that's going to hurt you, but it's going to heal the harm. you got to look at boundaries that way, is that when they're done right in love and they're appropriate and all this, you're not damaging people, but you're causing them pain. And, and here's, here's the mantra I think is really helpful. Just because somebody's screaming at you doesn't mean something bad's happening. Just because somebody's screaming bloody murder at you, you're mean, you're selfish, you know, look what you're doing to me, after all I've done for you. Just because they're yelling and screaming doesn't mean that something bad's happening. In fact, something really good may be happening. They may be learning that they can't that, that the, the universe is not going to tell them yes every time they have a whim, and they've got to grow up and be a grown up. They've got to grow up and be an adult. So evaluate the pain. If if your boundaries are angry and mean and depri depriving, well, no, you got to stop that. But just because they're hurtful, in the pain sense, might be a good thing. I love that passage in uh, Hebrews chapter twelve, for example, where the uh, the author tells you tells us that. Discipline feels painful for the moment, but for those who are trained by it, it brings forth a peaceable fruit of righteousness. So your boundaries bring the pain of growth. I don't know any kind of growth process, and I've been working with people a long time in corporations and individuals and uh, families and marriages and organizations, and I don't know anything really, really growth producing in terms of goals and missions and healing that didn't involve pain. So pain's not the bad guy. It's whether the pain is really going to harm somebody or not. So you're, you know, you don't, you don't put your child into a closet, and you don't not feed your kid, and you don't withdraw all love from your spouse. That's mean. But evaluate, is this hurt or harm? Okay? Very helpful. Uh, law number seven, the law of proactivity versus reactivity. Proactivity versus reactivity. Proactive means I have a deliberate choice. You know, you want to be Proactive about going to StubHub and get your tickets to the concert or to the football game. You don't want to wait till the last minute. If you're reactive, then all of a sudden you get you pay the highest prices and you get the worst seats. You want to go be proactive. I, ho I hope StubHub's not going to like call me up and say that I was using their name. Sorry, StubHub, if I used your name the wrong way. I, actually, I really like you. Reactive is when there is an impulsive choice. That's the last minute stat status. And boundaries should never be reactive. They should be proactive. You ever, you ever notice that, um, and I, I've dealt with a lot of people who struggle with this, you kind of let things go and let things go. Maybe you've got an addict in your life, or maybe you've got a really Im uh, immature person in your life, or somebody that's really dominating you, and you put up with it, you try to be, give them grace and give them grace and give them grace, and finally you just snap and you, you blow up and you yell and you scream and you say words that you don't think are nice words to say and you think, oh gosh, that wasn't me. Well, it is you. It's the you that said that is because you were, you were not being proactive. You were being pushed into a corner by your own fear and anxiety and being in conflict about boundaries and you finally blow up. We call that the ignore and zap mentality. I ignore it, bad behavior, I ignore it, I ignore it, and then I blow up and zap. Well, that's not a mature boundary. That's a reactive boundary where you just kind of jump out of something. I remember um, uh, I have a good, good friend who, had a, uh, who was an educator, and um, <clears throat> she did a good job, but she sort of didn't have good boundaries, and she had a really, really mean principle, and he intimidated everybody. And so um, she and I role-played a discussion she was going to have with him, 
And she went over it like, you know, I need to be, here's my task, you're asking too much of me, I want to do a good job, but this, you know, it's kind of a plan to have a better job. And she and she never said no to anybody, hardly. And she went to the, his office, and he started yelling at her, and, you know, what are you doing taking, my, taking up my time? And she, she had like four books with her, and she slammed them down on the desk and said, this is what you always do. You tell me everybody, nobody likes you. We don't want to work for you. You know, you're, and, and he, he sat back and went, okay, whatever you want. He was really nice to her until he retired because I'm not, I'm not prescribing this, but I'm just saying that's what happens when you ignore exact. It could have been handled a different way. Here's the thing about these is that when you've got reactive boundaries, what it means is that there's going to be some sort of a necessary verbal tantrum. Like my friend that blew up at the principal, a necessary verbal tantrum. If you've never had boundaries, the first time you say no, it's probably going to be kind of messy and not pretty and not very mature and adult. Just give it up. You'll get those later, but you've got to grow those boundaries up. Your boundaries are like little kids that are out of control and you've never said no. There's a great proverb, for example, in, uh, in Proverbs chapter 30. It says that the earth trembles when a slave becomes a king. Well, you've been a slave to having no boundaries all your life and never saying no and putting up with bad behavior. First time you say one, you might go, and, you know, you know, sound like a mean person. And that you're not a mean person. You've just got this immature boundary inside you. You're trying to grow up. So allow yourself to have these necessary verbal tantrums. Don't act on them. Don't shoot people. We think shooting people is a really bad idea. I'm just joking because, of course, you know that. But, but don't act on these feelings, but bring them into a relationship. Let other people know their frustration. Let people who are safe and loving and can understand that help you with that, and you'll move from the impulsive world to the proactive world, and your boundaries will be better. So my, my, my point is here is that there's this necessary, necessary phase of having those emotional kind of tantrums for a while, then after a while, you do it better, and you have more experience, and you feel more confident, and you're not as mad and frustrated anymore because you've had that part loved and all that. Uh, I would suggest um, also reading uh, my book, Loving People, and Loving People helps you to kind of assemble a life team around you that can listen to the frustration, but a few months from now, you just won't be that frustrated. You'll be, have moved from those impulsive tantrum boundaries to big girl, big boy pound, uh, boundaries. Next one, the law of envy. And the law of envy has to do with kind of what I think is the darkest part of the fall from, from the garden, is that um, we became an envious person. And the law of envy basically says that the only good, the only good in life, the only good things in life is outside me. The only good things are outside me. So I'm, I'm forever comparing myself to other people. Well, they're lucky. I'm single. And I, um, I always, these people, look at these people with these great dates. And I don't have good dates. They're just me who must be lucky. Or how'd that person get that great job? Well, did they just know somebody? Or, you know, did they schmooze somebody? And, and they're always looking outside themselves and being miserable, looking at the good fortune and good decisions of other people, not really looking at maybe the problem inside me. Think about it. Adam and Eve got this wonderful universe, and then God said, there's one thing that you can't do. One thing. You can't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's just not for you. And immediately, they, en they envied it. They envied the one thing they couldn't have. Instead of looking at all the wonderful things, they lusted inside themselves for the one thing because that's what envy does. Envy just says, good, the only good things are outside me. And, and the problem with envy is it makes you miserable because you never get enough. Because as soon as it passes from outside me to inside me, well now, it's no good anymore because I have it. It's just a trap. Because I now possess this relationship, I think, well, other people have a better relationship. Because I just got the good job, well, but other people got a better job. And it's a real tormenting phase, and people are miserable with envy. So, if you, if you are, if you're kind of lost in the allowing envy to take over, you'll never set boundaries because you'll always be thinking others are luckier, others are more fortunate, God loves them more than he loves me, and you'll never take ownership of your life, ownership of your decisions, and ownership of your choices. You know what I think is the best antidote to being stuck with envy? It's what the Bible calls gratitude, gratefulness, thankfulness. Romans 6 says we became obedient from the heart for those things that God gave us from the heart, saying thank you, we, we feel grateful. 
And gratitude is just the opposite of envy. Gratitude says, I don't have everything, but God loves me and I've got cool friends and some things I do and I'm a growing person and you know, I'm learning new habits and new hobbies and ways to give back. Like the old, the old saying was, happiness isn't having what you want, but wanting what you have. When your goal is to have what you want, envy is going to rule your life and you're going to become an emotional pack rat and you're going to become a financial pack rat and you're going to be just miserable, always looking out and comparing yourself to all the lucky people. Gratitude just says, certainly I want more. I have goals and I have dreams, but I'm pretty content like Philippians in chapter 3 tells us. Paul says, I'm content with what I have. Guy wrote that from prison. Okay. So, when we, the, the way this operates is when we don't have good boundaries because of envy, then we can never take control. When we do have good boundaries and, and we start thinking in terms of gratitude, you'll take charge of your life. So, if you're talking to somebody who's you know how we always have those friendship gripe sessions, you know, when you're at Starbucks and want to talk about, I don't know, the, the job or the boss or why you don't have enough money or the relationship. Everybody gets us a gripe session. It's just venting. Everybody needs to confess. But if it goes on the, with a person you're with where time after time after time is complaining about those things and those circumstances and they feel helpless and all the lucky people, why don't I challenge that a bit and just say, well, you know, you've got a lot of strengths. It seems like why don't you do something about it? I remember one time I was um, I was doing a solutions talk when Henry and I were doing these live. And um, we always like to talk to people at the end and answer questions. And a guy came up and had a question about some relationship problem. I can't remember what it was about, but I said, well, it kind of sounds like you got this. I don't know. It was like, should this person, it was a, a gal he was dating and she wasn't really responding and should he stay with her or, or to keep trying or whatever. I said, well, try X, Y, Z. I mean, there's some ideas. He said, okay. Came back the next week, and he was in line again. And I said, hi. He said, i got a question about this girl I'm dating. I said, well, is it the same question you asked last time? He goes, yeah. I said, well, remember when I gave you some assignments? He goes, yeah. I said, well, did you do them? He goes, no. Anyway, here's my problem. And I went, <laughs> hold it. Um, I, I'd like for you to go do what I said before you come back and start asking me about the problem. And he was really like, Confused, why would I do that? He just wanted, wanted somebody to vent in an envious way about this gal that wasn't responding right. So you kind of got to nip that in the bud. Don't allow envy to run things. Make you miserable. Um, the law of activity. Law number nine. Law of activity. The law of activity is basically that we, are de we were designed by God to take a thing called initiative. Take the initiative. When I have a money problem, I'm supposed to say, I'd better go solve my money problem, spend less or make more, right? When I've got a relationship problem, I've got to be the one that says, I don't like the way things are going in my marriage or with my kids or my friends or my colleagues at work. I've got to solve that. It means you are taking the, you are making the first move. That's what the law of activity says. It's sort of like in, um, in your physics class when you were in high school, and then they talked about the, the amount of effort it takes to move a stationary object versus the amount of effort it takes to, move, to, to change the direction of a moving object. A moving object that's already in motion takes a lot less effort to change its course than a, a stationary object, which is not moving at all, to move. It just That takes a lot more energy. And so the law of activity is that God works with you when you're moving. The, the Bible's full of sort of these, these commands and directives of God to be active people. You know, he, he, told, he told Abraham, you know, get out, of, get out of town and come to the new place that I've got for you. Uh, he told Gideon, get, get to work here. Um, God's always having us do things. Now, he's superintending things and he's running things in the big, big picture level. And he's he's uh, empowering us and all this. But we're supposed to be moving objects. Here's the problem, though. A lot of people take what's called a passive approach, and they wait. And you wait for somebody who hurt your feelings to apologize. You wait for that control freak in your life to say, oh, you're kind of quiet. You're, sniff you're sniffing in the corner. Did I hurt you? Or you wait for that you know, addict in your life to say, does my addiction bother you? They're not going to do that. They're out of control people. Don't wait for them to get it together. The Bible is, has some great passages about this. I, I love it when, 
when Jesus told different stories, two different stories that sort of spell it out. In Matthew chapter 5, he says, if you're going to give your gift to the altar and you realize your, your brother's got something, something against you, drop your gift, forget that, and go be reconciled to your brother. So if my brother's bugged with me because of something I did, I go to him. I take the first choice. The first, I take the activity. I take the first move. Shoot over to Matthew 18. He says, if your brother sins against you, go to him. So now it says, if it's my brother's fault, my friend's fault, I take the first move. Now, do the math. In Matthew, 8, Matthew 5, it says, if it's your fault, take the first move to reconcile. Matthew 18, it says, if it's your brother's fault, take the first move to reconcile. Huh. What does that say? Can't get out of here alive, can you? Well, it's a really good idea because nothing happens if you just wait and say, well, it's not fair. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the injured party. You're supposed to take care of this. Don't go off in the corner and eat worms and feel depressed and hope somebody will notice that. In fact, it's a, it's a pathology. It's called, people who are stuck in this have what we call a passive rescue wish. A passive rescue wish is when I sit around hoping somebody will notice that I'm in need and notice that I have a problem and, you know, see my unhappiness and come take care of me. Now, babies have this, and it's, it's, it's a developmental issue because you know, a four-month-old kid has very little way of letting mommy know that he or she is in trouble. But as grown-ups, we've got to give up and, and renounce the passive rescue wish and go, you know, it's not fair that I have to bear this, but it's my problem. I didn't start this, but it's my problem. So the law of activity says you take the initiative, even if it's not your fault. The drink is not your fault, or the control issue is not your fault, or the irresponsibility is not your fault. You still do this. Think about it this way. Look how God handled it. He has this race of people called humanity, and we all left him and said, we'll go our own way. We don't want you. We don't love you anymore. And he could have sat back and said, well, when you get your act together, come back to me. And he didn't do that. God himself took the initiative to come down in the form of Jesus, die for our sins. He solved a problem by taking initiative that he didn't have to do. So watch out for the passive rescue wish. Um, I see this all, a lot of times also in, in businesses and organizations and in corporate work where somebody will have um, somebody working for them that is um, maybe not doing things culturally right or has a bad attitude or not a good team ethic or is not performing right. And the, the boss will feel like, well, I'll just model this for them or I'll just be encouraging to them or I'll just kind of wait for them to get their act together. And really, that'll never work. You've got to take the initiative and say, Sam, Sally, we have a problem. The way your attitude is, or you're not getting reports in on time, or you're not making the phone ring, or you're not <clears throat> getting the research done, or you're not putting the structure here, or you're not leading your team, you be the one that takes initiative. Things work better when we, when we take the initiative. So remember the law of activity. And then law number 10, our last, our last law, is the law of exposure. And the law of exposure basically is, is that... It's our responsibility to make your boundaries evident. If somebody hurts your feelings when they're harsh and use bad words with you and are demeaning to you, you have to make your boundaries evident and tell them, I, I, that's not okay with me. I, I don't like that kind of treatment. We can joke around, but that's really hurtful. The word exposure means we took that from um, Ephesians where Paul talks in, in that chapter, in, in chapter uh, 4. He talks about being a child of light and bringing things to the light. That God is all about light, meaning exposure to relationship. And the deepest level, you're to be known. Every part of you is to be known. Your personality, your thoughts, your passions, your dreams, your hurts, your brokenness, your family of origin issues, your baggage, your sins, your, your goals. Every part of you is supposed to be exposed to relationship with God and also relationship to other people. That's a healthy life. When, when we don't have any parts of us that are unknown, our whole design was to be fully known by God and fully known by people. Not bad people and not crazy people, but by safe, good, healthy, loving people. If you expose your boundaries to the light, then the other person is now responsible for that. But if you don't expose your boundaries and say, hey, that hurt my feelings, or Hey, that's, that's not okay behavior, or we don't do drugs in my house, or that tone is really not okay with me. If we don't do that, then we bear part of the responsibility for the failure. One of the things I do sometimes when I'm working with people 
who have the, the, the boundary stuff is new to, is I'll say, okay, I see that you got this out of control relationship or a family thing or a business thing. We'll do the analysis and figure out the plan. And I'll say, okay, here's something hard, but it'll help you. The first thing I want you to do is that you have to make an apology. Apology, but they're a drug addict, or they're the ones that aren't performing in the company, or they're mean, or they're the control freak. I said, no, well, that's true, but you have an apology to make. And your apology is to say, I have not been clear with you about how oh, not okay this was. I haven't been clear. I haven't exposed my boundaries. I haven't made my boundaries evident to you about how much this bothers me or hurts me or alienates me. So I bear some of the responsibility for the fact that you behave this way. And I'm sorry. And, and I won't do it again. I'm learning a lot about that's my piece. I've been kind of quiet, or I pulled away, or I shut down, or I kind of judged you and said bad things about you, or I went to my friends and told them oh, what a knucklehead you are and I didn't tell you. Well, that's not okay, and I'm sorry, and I won't do that anymore. So from now on, I'll let you know, and I'm telling you right now, just so you'll know, that this behavior isn't okay, or I really want you to change this, or whatever. Now, the other person can never say, well, they didn't tell me, but Otherwise, they're just kind of walking through life like some people do. Some people walk through life with no clue of the impact they have on other people. You ever seen that in, um, I travel a lot. I'll see this in airports where there are some people, God bless them, and we all of us have our issues. Some people sort of wander back and forth in an airport, kind of, in airports, you kind of, you, there's lanes. I mean, walking from one gate to another, there's lanes. You stay on one lane, and people coming the other way stay on the other lane. And there's people that just sort of wander back and forth and, and look around. And you can see people stopping and their luggage moving this way because the other person has no idea where the lines are. And I don't know, maybe they're clueless or maybe they, that's just how they are. But it's sort of like people just don't know where the, the boundary line is. So your job is, if, you're, if your financial boundary or your sexual boundary or your spiritual boundary or your how do I like to be treated boundary, if it's not being, you know, respected, it's your job to say, hey, that hurt. One of the best things you can do is to let somebody know, when you do this behavior, I feel very alone. I'm not mad at you right now. I'm not trying to change you. I'm not your mom or your dad. I just... I feel kind of by myself. I feel sort of empty around you. Now, how can somebody get really mad when somebody says, I feel alone? I mean, you have to be pretty sick to say, well, I don't care that you're alone. And there's a certain percentage of, you know, I always talk about the bell curve. There's a certain percentage of the bell curve of humanity that, that really doesn't care. And they're not good people and need to stay away from them. But most people say, well, I don't, I don't like it that you feel alone. I, your relationship's important to me. Well, if it is, then we want to, we want to, you know, make that clear. So make them evident. So take that as kind of your your problem is that maybe you didn't make it very clear. Maybe you joked about it or maybe you sort of like were indirect about it like, oh, you know, yeah, that 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 sarcastic sense of humor you have, yeah. Well, maybe they think that was a compliment instead of, I feel like a piece of dirt when you say that to me about how fat I am at the party. Now that's direct, but now you're making your boundaries evident, okay? I wrote a book called, um, uh, who's pushing your buttons? That talks about people that push those buttons and they really have no clue. They're nice people, but they're kind of clueless. They have some character issues. And it's your job to say, this is no longer okay. I mean, I can't control you. I can't stop you, but it's not okay. Make them your, make them your, um, your, your project.